or tape, CDs, DVDs to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Sunday afternoon, May the 27th, 1990. Memorial Weekend, Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Dr. Bill Null teaches on uh, intercession, and Rod Johnson finishes the afternoon service. You know, to some of you, that's like brand new, what we've been having here this week, but to some of the rest of us, it's just like we can remember all of our lives. When it's getting better and better and good, <laughs> gooder and gooder. Amen. And it's amazing as the trotters and us have kind of been visiting a little bit together how our things of our past have, people of the past have intertwined both of our lives and, and uh, how God works and, and does things that uh, and we can set and re- reminisce to the days of when uh, the glory of God in days past that has touched both of our lives is the same things. One particular instance was is a man named Frosty Foster, who I don't imagine anybody here outside of the Trotters and Irma and I have ever heard of. But uh, he got saved under the ministry of, of a minister named Ban- Banta, brother and sister Banta, and my mother and father and uh, and Jack and Irene Gibbs. And this man was a in the underworld, didn't call it the mafia then, uh, but uh, he was in and, and uh, quite, quite a character, great big guy, bigger than, than Rod, taller than Rod, bigger than Rod, cross-eyed, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but uh, uh, I'm just thinking of the Bantas, uh, she wanted so bad to to play the piano, and I guess they didn't have any pianist in the in the church. She was praying; they were praying that. Uh, and one night, in the middle of the night, the Lord woke her up. And they had a piano in the house, but she couldn't play it. And the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, said, "Go downstairs and play the piano." She said, "I can't play the piano." And the Spirit of the Lord said, "Go play the piano." She got up, went downstairs, and sat down at the piano. And the anointing of the Lord come upon her. And she began to play, and Brother Bannon got up to see what was coming off. And from that day, as long as she lived, she could sit down and play anything. Never never need to look at and didn't understand music, but she could play as good as any concert pianist that you ever heard. See what God can do? When our heart is, is to is to unto him, that to glorify him. And God he gave her the desire of her heart. Not only hers, but for multitudes more. I don't know you. As a boy, you if you ever came to the camp meetings at, at, uh, at uh, uh, Lincoln and, and, and with your dad or ever at Lincoln and, and out at uh, Petersburg, well, you would have heard her play. You probably... Anna B. Locke to... Oh, Anna B. Anna B. Locke was Irma's godmother. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, how small the world is. How great our God is. Amen. Amen. I remember back in the Dutchies days of the Dust Bowl, that very few here will even know what I'm talking about, when the, the, the wind blew the dust across <coughs> from western... <clears throat> Texas and Kansas and it came across Illinois and Indiana and Michigan and, and Iowa it came across in great clouds and actually turned the sky dark in the middle of the day or turned the sky like blood red at, at high noon the sky it would be like blood red and no matter what you did you shut the doors and the windows and everything you could and, and even when it, and you didn't open them and even when it was gone, the house sometimes would have an eighth of an inch or more of dust on everything. 
and yet everything was shut tight. But I remember in those days when uh, nobody had any money, and uh, we lived by what we raised, we ate by what we raised, uh, poultry and meat, and uh, we burned, we burned, we couldn't buy coal, and we lived where there wasn't wood to cut, so we uh, we burnt corn for for coal. Corn was what we burnt in the in the kitchen stove and in the in the big round uh, heater. What do you call it? Huh? Yeah, the round oak heater. We burnt corn for for fuel. Yeah, well, we never did that. Yeah, but, but we had. But I can remember, you know, when the things were so dry and there was no water. I can remember my dad walking out across forty acres of corn that was withered and dying praying for that God would survive and make it take care of it and I can remember it raining in the middle of the night on that 40 acres of corn and nobody else got any rain and our corn grew and we had feed for the cattle and God heard and answered prayer he sent rain when there was no rain he sent rain when there wasn't any clouds and he watered our corn and we had feed. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And some of you don't understand that those days may lie ahead of us again. For God is still God. And He's the God that answers prayer by fire and by rain and by the earthquake. He's the God who answers prayer. And Jesus was His name. I know Brother Trotter can come up here and tell you instances that as greater, greater than these that happened to them when they were in Africa and other places. How God fed, how God took care, how He told about uh, when they helped, when when God held back the rain to take His Father out uh, for, from the jungle. There was no way but God, but God. Oh, what a great God we serve! And we haven't begun to tap the resources that are ours. We're so ignorant and dumb and rebellious. Oh, God, forgive us and cleanse us and wash us. Move upon us by your Spirit. We can walk before you in that place of righteousness and holiness. For thy Spirit and the angel of the Lord walks with us. And thy covering and thy protection is about us. Jesus is Lord. Holy, holy is His name. Praise you, Jesus. Irma's folks lived in those days. They sat down to eat many a time at the table and set the table and sat down to eat. Nothing to eat. Sit down. Brother Wharton would pray. Somebody would knock on the door and bring a pot of soup, a pot of stew, bread they'd baked. God supplied 35 cents, 75 cents in an offering to take care of a family for weeks and weeks on end. But God, but God, today we think we've got to have so much, and we've got so much, we don't begin to appreciate anything we've got. Oh, God, thy mercy and thy grace, thy mercy and thy grace. Jesus is Lord. Oh, where is the God of Elijah? He's in our midst. Yes, yes, he is. And we know it not. Oh, God, greatly is to be praised. Holy, holy is the Lord. What a most awesome thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. I want mine to go before, not to follow after. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. I tell you, the last two days, the glory and presence of God has been such, and is such, that it should cause us to cry from the depths of our spirits, My God, my God, my God, cleanse me, wash me. Make me to be that which I cannot be except by thy blood. Show me the air of my ways. 
Convict me, O God, convict me. O God, O God, O God. There's a new day rising in the land. I can see it on the eastern horizon. Jesus is appearing to his people. Let our spirits and our hearts be open to receive that which he's bringing forth. Talking about intercession. What the Lord's requiring of his people in these hours and days. Doc's going to talk to you for a few minutes about intercession. Praise you, Lord God. First, I want to draw a picture of Moses' tabernacle. When I started about, oh, about six months ago, the pastor at my local church asked me if I would talk to the intercessory group, the prayer captains, about intercessory prayer. And so I began to labor before God to know what to say. Because I, prayer is my whole life, and I can talk about prayer for hours on end. And so I began to talk about first about the conditions for answered prayer. And then I begin to talk about the different types of intercessors and the art of interceding. And I looked through the Bible and I found all, I found the, the intercessors listed in the Bible, namely Abraham, Moses, Daniel, and then the great intercessor, Jesus Christ. And I begin to look into their lives and find the, the characteristics that each one had that were common and the things that were necessary for an intercessor. And I put all of this down on paper, and I gave it to my people. And then one night God spoke to me, and he said, Look at the tabernacle. And I got up, and I began to read about the tabernacle. I just began to read in the Bible. And God, as I read, he spoke to me how the priest, specifically the high priest, was an intercessor for the people, and how everything in the tabernacle was related to intercession, to coming into God's presence. And today I'm going to try to relate a portion of that to you. I, I told Glenn that I, I asked permission really to relate this to the morning prayer group. And I intended to talk about 15 or 20 minutes and, and give them some written material and, and just sort of skim over it and, and, and hoping that I could encourage them to, to look into the scriptures. Because it's such a deep subject that I could talk from now to this time tomorrow, I think. But I wanted to see if I could give you what God gave me, a part of it. And first I want to draw a picture of the tabernacle. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the tabernacle, but there may be one or two people who aren't familiar with what Moses' tabernacle looked like. You know, uh, we said this, uh, I think Sister Linda was saying that, they, you know, that sometimes there are people who uh, you take for granted, they know something and they, they really don't. And so I want to take a minute or two and draw out a, just a simple chalk drop diagram, and then I'll try to ex show you what God showed me. That's a, very, that's a very crude diagram. The tabernacle has a number of, of symbolisms. It was 100, 100 by 150 cubits. That's 150 feet by 75 feet. And it was surrounded by a linen fence, which is a large square. The linen fence was seven and a half feet high, and there was a gate on the east end that was 30 feet wide. And this linen wall that went around it was made of linen, and that indicated the righteousness. Linen is always a type of righteousness. In Revelations uh, 9.18, you will find that is a scripture that, that's the basis for that. It says, linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Uh, it separates, it's a wall, and it separates believers from the world. And the believer, and the world is on the outside of this fence. And it's seven and a half feet, they can't see over it. And there's only one way in, and that's through the gate on the east end, and that is Jesus Christ. And if we want to come to Jesus, we have to come through this gate on the east end. And there's a linen veil that hangs down. And in it, it has red threads and blue threads and purple threads. The red threads indicate Jesus' blood. The blue threads indicate heaven. The purple th threads are a blending of red. You mix red and blue, you get purple, and that's an indication of royalty of Jesus Christ. And so as you come through the gates, you have to come through Jesus Christ. And the first thing that you see when you come in 
is the brazen altar, and that's the B-A, the brazen altar, or the altar of brass. Now, brass stands for judgment, and it was, uh, it was seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet. It was four and a half feet tall. It was a big thing, and it confronted you when you came in. Now, everybody always thought that, I always thought that everything in the tabernacle was beautiful, but there was nothing beautiful about the, blade, about the brass altar. It was an instrument of death. It was big. It had fire on it. It was hot, and it was covered with blood. It was blood splattered, and there was blood poured out on the ground around it, and it was an instrument of death. Now, it indicates, it is where the sacrifice was made to propitiate, to cover the sins. Not to propitiate for them, but to cover them. And as I, as I looked at that altar, at that instrument of death, I realized then that Jesus Christ had died for my sins. He was the propitiation for my sins. Hebrews 9.11 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And Jesus is a propitiation. He says, We have an advocate. 1 John, 1, 1 John 2, 2 says, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Jesus died on that, on that altar for my sins and for your sins. But he died for me. If there had been nobody else in the world, I know that he would have died for me. He died on that altar for me. And so as you come in and you look at the altar, at the brazen brass altar where Jesus died, you are confronted by the cross of Jesus Christ. You know that you cannot approach him in your sin. You cannot approach God in your sin, in your backslidden condition. You must appropriate the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse you. You must appropriate to cleanse you. And once you come to the altar and you have met Jesus Christ and you've been cleansed by his blood, you stand in the court. That's, that's the court. Now, the Scripture says that you enter into this court with praise and thanksgivings. That's the outer court. That's where you stand. You can stand there and you can praise him. And he's there. But he's sort of off a little bit. But you, but you get in. You see, praise is a gate that you come in. Salvation is the wall. That's the linen wall. Isaiah says, salvation, the new Jerusalem, that salvation is my wall. And the gates shall be named praise. So you come in through praise and you come into, that, into, the, into the outer court. But you cannot go any further until you come to the labor. Now, the labor, they didn't have, they don't know how big the labor was. There were no dimensions given for the labor. But you know what Moses made the labor out of? Anybody know what the labor was made? It's made out of brass. You know where he got the brass? The women's hand mirrors. That's right. He asked for the women's hand mirrors. They were made out of polished brass. And that is in... Uh, uh, Exodus 20, 38.8. He asked for the women's hand mirrors. He made it. He put water in it. And the priest had to wash his hands and his feet between the altar, as if we, before he went to the altar to, to offer a sacrifice, or before he went into the tabernacle. And when he looked into this mirror, into this polished brass with water in it, he looked into it, he said it was a mirror. And the mirror is God's Word. As you read God's Word, you'll find that God's Word is reading you and is pointing out your sins to you. And if you want to be an intercessor, you would better get acquainted with God's Word. And if you want to come to God in intercession, remember that you must wash at the labor before you can approach the tabernacle. You must wash in the labor before you come to the altar of sacrifice. You, and you will find that in, when, you, when you get into the tabernacle, you must have been to the altar of sacrifice before you can come in, because you will need there 
There's a need. You have to go to the altar of sacrifice. We'll come to that later. But as you wash in the labor, oh, God. Ephesians 5, 36 says that the, Jesus is coming to be washed in the water of the Word. Hebrews 10, 11 speaks of washing of the water. The Word is the water that will wash you. It will also heal you. The Word's a mirror. In James 1, 23 to 25, it speaks of the mirror, and so does 2 Corinthians 3, 18. So once you've washed in the water of the Word, then you come into the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle was a small tent. It was not an imposing structure. It was, uh, 40, it was 30 by 10 cubits. That's 45 feet by 15 feet, and it was 15 feet tall. It was made out of boards and had three coverings over it. And it had, a, it had an entrance on the east end, and it had a veil. The veil was linen with red threads, blue threads, and purple threads. The same as coming into salvation. Then you've got to come into the tabernacle. How do you come into the tabernacle? You come in through Jesus Christ. Who baptizes you in the Holy Spirit? Jesus Christ. You come into the tabernacle. Now, in the tabernacle, there was light. The tabernacle was divided into two portions, the outer court and the inner court. And there was light in the outer court. There was a lampstand that had seven lamps on it, and it burned continually. Praise your Lord God. It was composed of pure gold. It weighed 90 pounds. It burned pure olive oil. It burned continuously. Uh, Exodus uh, 27, 20 to 21 tells you that it, was a, it burned pure olive oil. It burned continuously. And Exodus 37 to, to 9 tells you that the priest tended the lamp twice a day. He trimmed the wick. He poured more oil in it. But he stopped and he tended the lamp twice a day. When did he tend the lamp? He tended the lamp before he went to the altar of incense. Before he went on the morning and the evening sacrifice, before he went to the altar of incense, he had to tend the lamp. The, ta- the lamp is a type of the Holy Spirit. It, it's only by the light of the Holy Spirit can you see your way once you have entered the tabernacle. On the other side is the showbread. The table of showbread was uh, whole three feet by a foot and a half wide. It had twelve loaves, one for each tribe, in rows. And Jesus, that's in Leviticus 24, 5 to 9. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven in John 6, 48. And you can only see Jesus in the light of the Holy Spirit. And that is the bread that you must eat. Jesus said, if you don't eat my blood, my, he said, if you don't eat my flesh, you have no part in me. And so as you come in, Jesus, you must partake of Jesus. Jesus must be the most important thing in your life. And then, after you've tended the lamp, you've tended the Holy Spirit, and how do you tend the Holy Spirit? Well, praise God, you pray in tongues and build up your faith. Did you know Jude 20 says, building up your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost? Now, you want to approach God, you better pray in the Holy Ghost and get your faith built up and get closer to God. And so you come to the altar of incense, and there you're standing outside the veil. Now, this was a very special holy altar. It was made of gold. It was one cubit by one cubit square, and it was 36 inches tall. So it was about a foot and a half by a foot and a half by 36 inches tall. Taller than the rest of the furniture. It had a ring around the top. And incense was offered there. It was never used for sacrifice, except once a year the high priest would come in and put, the, and put blood on the corners when he was atoning for his sin. That's the only time that blood was ever placed on it was once a year on the Day of Atonement. But it had incense on it. Now, 
That's where the priest burned incense. But to burn incense, he had to bring coals from the altar. And he burned the incense and the incense of the prayers of the saints. Now, what does all this mean? Well, it means this, brothers and sisters. You want to come before God. God lives in the Holy of Holies. Behind the veil that has been rent, and there's a way through the veil in the flesh of Jesus Christ. There stands uh, the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, which contains a broken law. The, the manna of pot of manna is gone. Aaron's rod's been taken out. But the, pot, but the broken law is still there. And exactly over, I mean, there's another piece of furniture that sits exactly on top of it. It's called the mercy seat. It's made out of beaten gold in one piece. It has the sharpens of God on either side. And Scripture tells you that the God of Israel but dwells between the sherbin and looks down on the mercy seat and looks down on the blood that is sprinkled. We have a bloody religion. We have a bloody religion. Blood may not mean much to you, but it means a lot to God. And that's what counts. It's the blood when he sees the blood. When the death angel came through, he passed over the houses where he saw the blood. When, gee, when God looks down on the mercy seat and he sees the blood of Jesus Christ, he passes over your sins, praise God. He does not hold you accountable. One other interesting thing in the veil. It's made out of linen. It has red threads, blue threads, purple threads. But he has one other thing. Designs of cherubims. Now, what are cherubims? What are they? They are the chariot of God. Praise you, Lord. That's one scripture I want to read. Let's look at. Uh, let's look at first at Second Samuel twenty-two eleven. Second Samuel twenty-two eleven. Second Samuel twenty. He rode upon the cherubim and flew. He was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made the darkness canopies around him and the dark waters and the thick clouds of the skies. And from the brightness before him, coals of fire were ended. So he rode upon the cherubim and flew upon the wings of the wind. That's your scripture, Irma, that you were talking about this morning. The uh, the second one is uh, ooh. 1 Chronicles 28.8, And here he's talking about the construction of the sheriff in the, in the temple of Solomon. And he said, For the construction of the chariot, that is the golden cherub, and that spread their wings and overshadow their heart. I tell you that if you go back to Ezekiel, you'll see that the cherubins are... The chariot of God. They are the chariots of fire that carry him. Praise you, Lord. If you really want an interest, if you really want as a revelation of Jesus Christ in his pre incarnate glory, read Ezekiel with that in mind. And you'll see the pre incarnate Jesus Christ and you'll know the price he paid. For Philippians says he gave that all up. He poured all that out to be made a man, to appear in this, as a man. Praise you, Lord, oh God. So what does all this mean? Well, it means this, people. If you want to intercede, you've got to get yourself right with God. You've got to approach that, that altar, that bronze altar, that place of death. You've got to come, you've got to come to it, you've got to wash your feet and your hands in the labor and let the Word of God be a mirror to you and let it read you and let it show you what in your life God wants you to get rid of. And then you come to that altar and you lay down your body as a living sacrifice before him, which is your reasonable service, that you might know what the good and perfect will of God is. You come to the altar and then you take the coals from that altar and you walk back to the labor and then you walk into the into the into the tabernacle and you carry the coals from the altar and you stop and you tend the lampstand. You stand and you pray in the Spirit and you get down 
before Almighty God and you and you lay your life down before him and say, Not my will, Lord God, but show us be done. Lord, what is there that you want me to intercede for today? What kind of work do you want done in the heavenlies today, Lord? Not what I want, Lord, it's not me, but what you want, Lord God. Lord, I'm not coming for myself, Lord. I'm coming to serve you, Lord. Not for myself, Lord, but for you. For I know that you will meet all of my, that you know my needs, and you will meet all of my needs of your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But Lord, let me come and let me serve you. And you take of Jesus Christ, and you take him into your life, and you come before the altar of incense, and you pick up that special incense that can be only used in one place, and you put it into the end of the blazing, into your blazer, and you swing it. And your prayers will rise up before God into heaven as a sweet-smelling savor. And you stand there and you pray for the will of God. And you pray for the will of God. And then you stand and there is a time, my friend, that, praise God, he will take you into the Holy of Holies. He will take you through the rent veil. You cannot walk through of your own accord. But there is, Hebrews says, that we have a way into the Holy of Holies through the body of Christ. Through his flesh we can walk in and you can stand at the foot of the altar and you can stand in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.10 2, tells you that we have been raised with him, that we have been raised with him high above all principality and power in every in every power in this world, and when you go into the Holy of Holies and you can stand in Him and you can speak forth the Word of God out of your lips and you know that it will come to pass because what you are saying is the will is a perfect will of God and He says when you know that you speak according to the will of God that He will hear you and when He hears you you will have what you ask for and as you ask but you ask according to the will of God for that is your divine purpose that is a purpose for which God has raised you up as an intercessor, that you might do his will, that you might command you me. Isaiah says, command you me according to the works of my hand. God wants you to command him or command him according to the will of God, that his will might come to pass. John Wesley said, the will of God will not come to pass until believing Christians pray for it to come to pass. So you come and you say, Father, use me. And you lay in, and you lay in agony before the cross. And you lay in agony before God, before it. And you look at the powers and the principalities, and they must obey you. But I'll tell you this, God will not hear a gimme prayer. Did you know that God won't hear a gimme prayer? Gimme, Lord. Oh, God, gimme, Lord, I want this. And that prayer doesn't get out of the room. A true intercessor knows that God will provide for him out of all his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God expects that there are prayers in the Bible that you can pray that you know that according to the will of God. The one I hear the most is to light yourself in God and he will give you the desires of your hearts. I hear that quoted. And I say to them, have you ever looked up the Hebrew word that they translate for delight? Do you know what that word means? It comes from a Hebrew root that means to be molded by. You be molded by God. You'll desire what God desires. And he will, your heart will desire what he desires, and then he will give it to you. But be molded by him. God is not going to answer your fleshy, your fleshy demands. Praise you, Lord God. I tell you, we serve a holy God. We serve a holy and a righteous and a powerful God who loves you, who laid down his Son for you, that you might be sons of God, that you might have many, that he might have many sons. And he is raising up overcomers, people who are willing to lay down their demands of the world. He said, Be ye holy as I am holy. You're not going to be. A, it says, Without holiness you will not see God. Do you know what holiness means? Everything in the, in the New Jerusalem is going to be holiness unto God. Holiness means separated unto God. You know, they, when I went down the, the Colorado River, I took my kids on a float trip once, and I went down the Colorado River. And we looked down the river, and we would try to figure out how big something was. 
and we could never judge it. We could never figure out how big it was until we got there because there was no standard point of reference that we could look at. We didn't, we didn't know how, anything, how big anything was around it. There weren't any things that were standard size that we could compare it against down there where it was. And so we just had to wait till we got there. And that is what holiness is. God is holy. And there ain't nothing in this world that we can compare that against. So you don't know what holy means, but it means that you are separated from the world. That's what it means. It means you ain't walking right here. It means you getting over here or away from it, where God wants you. You're not walking in, in you're not walking in sin. I tell you, the old man is dead. But I tell you, he was crucified with Jesus Christ, but he will be resurrected if you try to walk in the world. He'll come alive. That's the reason you've got to go out to the altar, of the brazen altar, and lay it down every time you want to pray. Every time you want to do service for God, you've got to go back out to the brazen altar, and you've got to pick up some coals. That means that you've got to go out and lay it all down before him and say, God, it's all yours, Lord. I talked to you last night about laying it down. What are you hiding behind? Are you hiding behind a good job, a fine education? Are you hiding behind money? Are you hiding behind good looks? Or are you willing to lay those things down for God? Remember when Moses had the staff in his hand? Moses and God said, What's that you got in your hand, Moses? And he said, It's all I got left, Lord. It's all I got left. He said, you, when, when I followed you, when you told me to leave Israel, I mean Egypt, and I came out here in the desert, everything I own, everything I got on me belongs to my father-in-law, all these sheep and everything. He said, I don't own anything except this stick that I, is my snake-killing stick, him. And he said, throw it down. He said, throw it down. And Moses said, but it's all I got left. And he threw it down. And it became a poisonous serpent. You know how I know it's poisonous? Because Moses knew it was poisonous. He fled from it. It had been an unpoisoned snake. He just sort of looked at it, but it was a viper. And he told him to go back and pick it up by the tail. By the tail, Lord. Now, Moses had been out there a long time. He knew the business end was on the other end. You don't pick up no snake by the tail. But he picked it up. And it became, what did it become? It became the rod of God. Not Moses' rod anymore. The Bible called it the rod of God. And it was a rod that he carried with him through Sinai. It was a rod that he opened the Red Sea with. It was a rod he struck the, he struck the rock with. It was a rod he held up to, to, to defeat the Amalekites. It was the rod of God. When you throw down this thing that God tells you to throw down, he'll let you pick it up again, but it'll be his. And when you're willing to lay it down. And so you have to go to the altar and you've got to lay it all down before God. And he'll give you some coals to burn it with. And you go back in there, and on those coals, you put the incense, and your prayers will rise up before God, and he will cleanse you. And every time you pray and you read the Word, he will work in you, and you will find that you are changing, that people will say, what has happened to you? Said, you've changed. What's happened to you? And little by little and precept upon precept and time upon time, God will change you. And he will provide for you and for your family and for your loved ones. And I'll tell you the intercessor is our highest calling. The intercessor is what God is looking for. And only an intercessor can enter in behind the veil to stand before the altar of God. And God is looking did you know that Scripture said the eyes of God search true and full over all the world to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him? So, people, I call you today to intercession. I call you to come to God, for God needs people. Our country needs people who are willing to stand in the gap against abortion, against pornography against sexual immorality, against immorality in high places. Nobody. You know, it used to be that the, when you dealt with the government, you were dealing with an honest bunch. They're a bunch of crooks. 
I mean, everywhere you read, there's corruption, and they don't even put them in jail for it. Oh, our country needs an assessor's people. I call you this day. I call you. God's calling you. The price is high, but the rewards are greater. Praise you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Glenn. Oh, God. God told me that I would never just to give a religious lecture without offering people a chance to respond. I say to you today, if you want to be an assessor, you want God to change your life. You want God to give you a hunger. I want you to stand up. I want you to hold up your hands now. Oh, God, and receive now. Oh, God, pour out your spirit, Lord God. Oh, God, pour out your spirit. Create a hunger in your people's heart, Lord, for your word, for your will, Lord God. Touch your people, Lord God. Touch them and draw them out, Lord God. Lord, fill them with your spirit, Lord. Lord, touch them for the call and gifts and call of God without repentance, Lord. I ask you to call them to draw them in with cords of love, Lord. Draw them in, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. I just praise you and bless you and glorify you, Lord. Touch them now, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Just thank you and praise you and bless you for it, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. moving to do things in the lives of his people. And it won't only be just you here, but God's going to move on others that hear the tapes from these meetings. And he'll work the same work in their lives. And he's working in our lives. But God is serious. The hour of playing church is past. But the church doesn't know that. Help us to be sensitive to the Spirit of the Lord as it moves in our midst and that we become faithful to the calling that He's called us to. It's a high calling. It's a high calling. And we're not worthy of that calling. But His grace and His mercy is extended unto us. And we're so unworthy. We're filthy. Filthy rags before the throne, except for Calvary, Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. You know, uh, I understand something about the veil that we don't talk about, don't hear taught. And it's hard to comprehend. But the veil was a one-piece item. But yet the priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year. You realize that the priest walked through the veil? He didn't part the veil. He walked through the veil. That's why it had to be rent when Jesus at Calvary. So that it was the Holy of Holies was made available to whosoever will may come. Lord, I want to be. I'm a whosoever. Amen. But it requires holiness unto the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Well, we'll take a couple of minutes and receive the offering. And then Rod will come and pick up where he left off yesterday. Hallelujah.
What a blessing, brother. What a blessing. I approach this with utter awe. And I sit there and I say, Lord, I prefer to just sit and be fed and worship. I, uh, truly, the presence of God. This camp meeting exceeds anything of the camp meetings I've been at. I've been at a few, not a lot. But uh, the presence of the Lord is so precious. He's doing so much. And uh, just a quick couple of things that I want to mention in respect to the holiness and the beauty and the working of God. We're being brought into understanding of what true body ministry is. And I am seeing prophecy in my life being fulfilled daily. And this camp meeting again has fulfilled some, and it's exciting to see. Um, probably 12, I don't know how many years ago I met Sister Sutter. Uh, how many years have we known one another, Linda? Uh, 78, that's 12 years ago. Um, the Lord quickened to my heart and uh, that we would be ministering together. And at that time, it seemed totally out of sorts. <laughs> and my wife spoke to me, and she spoke to me as a prophetess. And she said, God has brought Linda along because you never had a brother or a sister, and you're going to learn what it is to have a sister. Now, we make fun of this a lot of times because we, 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 we truly... Um, I don't know what it's like to have a real sister, but if it's anything like I feel towards her, uh, I'm glad I don't have one. Because <laughs> she's enough to be concerned about. <laughs> but I watch my sons. My sons are willing to, to, to fight to draw blood for my, my daughter. My one, in fact, I've seen them. The, um, I, I, I pity the boyfriends he went out with because they... They, they gave him the works. <laughs> and uh, that's the way I feel towards Linda in spiritual things. And sometimes it gets me in hot water with her, and other times it doesn't. But uh, uh, this morning as she was being used by God, I, I wanted to stand back there and I wanted to shout glory, hallelujah, and raise the white banner of victory because of the anointing that was flowing upon her and through her. And, you better take good care of her, Dad, because I'm concerned. <laughs> you do. I know it. I'm thrilled that she's here. And uh, the Lord even confirmed that to me. But uh, <laughs> I said that with respect. You know that. <laughs> but uh, um, so there was a part of, there were other things that happened that would, in that area. And Brother Trotter, how the body of Christ, um, you didn't know it. And the, someone mentioned the TV program um, that you were on. I think it was Irma. Uh, the Sunday after uh, the explosion happened. And uh, um, I, for some reason, well, I know why now, is the Lord, was watching that program. And I was at a point in life where I was uh, uh, looking up to the stomach of an ant and saying, boy, that's high, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And uh, going through some great ministry prevailing as we all do in our Christian walks because we all have a ministry and God used you on that program in such a mighty mighty way to minister to me and uh, um, I said to my wife I have such a kinship with well not only the organization down there and uh, I've seen some things in the spirit but uh, with you over the TV and uh, it's as if I felt that I was going to be and then here when, when they said a, a, a brother Trotter was going to be here well I didn't know who that fellow was on the TV I just knew that by the spirit and isn't that something how God brings together but also how he uses the body of Christ um, to minister to one another and uh, I, I know I'm supposed to pick up and finish uh, what I did but um, with your permission I need to just point out something here because uh, Doc was used so mightily on something and uh, um, 
turn with me. I want to show you something so beautiful. I wouldn't take time. And I've preached on this a long time ago. Um, but I just want to re refresh your memory. Revelation chapter... Uh, we won't get into a lot of scripture on this. Why I can't find it when I want it. Here we go. Revelation 17, 14, or 12. No, yeah, 12 to 14. And I just want to show you something um, to tell you where we're headed as Doc is... is oh, man. I'd sit under his teaching all day. Praise the Lord. That's exciting. Now, I don't, I'm not going to touch on anybody's theology. Um, quite frankly, we have a little lady up in northern Wisconsin. Um, she says, I don't want you to come in here and preach pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. She says, as far as I'm concerned, it's pan-trib. However, it pans out the way it's going to be. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, honest and truly speaking, uh, um, I think I know what's right, and you're probably wrong, and I'm right. You know, that's how I feel. But uh, truthfully speaking, however it pans out, I just want to be walking today at peace with my Maker. And that's what Paul said we should do. Uh, just be prepared. Be prepared, okay? But uh, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour. Now, I want to just draw your attention to this with the beast. Personally, I believe the ten horns are in place now, but that's another subject. But I want you to see that they are receiving power as kings. Kings stand for authority, and they are with the beast. This means that they are representing a united force with the beast system, with the system of the world, with the world can be called Antichrist system if you want it. Um, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Now the New Age movement cannot work effectively unless the people come together and are of one mind as they meditate and dwell on things of psychic realm power that they call supernatural power. Um, Everything is coming together, okay? Um, and they are surrendering their authority or power and strength. They say, we are rece receiving strength from a God. They don't know which God it is. It's the B-system God. All right? Now, look at verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb. Now, remember who the Lamb is. The Lamb is Jesus Christ, and Christ is where today, but sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and He is sitting in victory today, and He has assigned His church to be the tool to go through to the victory. Hallelujah. To manifest the victory in this world, because creation originally was such that man lived with authority of a free will and had dominion over everything untainted by sin. They have one, uh, or these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Hallelujah. Who's going to overcome them? The Lamb is going, the Christ, the authority and the power of the Christ that is coming forth in the church shall overcome them. Hallelujah. It's made up of overcomers and conquerors. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. That tells me that he is going to come with an authority to go into battle. That shows when, he, when I see Lord of lords, I immediately think of a master. And when I think of a master, I think of servanthood. And he is going to, he is going to be using a people who are true servants. And to be a true servant, you've got to be a true intercessor. You've got to learn what Doc taught just a few minutes ago. Hallelujah. And those that are with him uh, will recognize him also as king of kings. Now, a king dictates authority and sets up the rules of the kingdom. What kingdom is he in charge of? Heaven. And establishing it here. 
So he's bringing heavenly rules to drive out the force of darkness. Hallelujah. This is the end of part A. Please play part B. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.